well, we have started Lent. I'm not talking about the stuff in your belly buttons. When I was a kid, I used to think that's what it was, I, you know? Um, I would hear the word Lent, and I had absolutely no idea what it meant. And so this past Wednesday was Ash Wednesday. Um, so if you saw coworkers or friends at school or maybe even yourself somewhere picked up the sign of the cross with the ashes, um, representing a time of entering into preparation, right? Uh, and so kind of the, uh, a big part of uh, Lent is this idea of 40 days that are set apart to prepare for, uh, in this case, Good Friday and Easter. So we're kind of counting down. It seems like we just took our last Christmas tree down, and now it is time for Easter. Um, but uh, uh, this is a rich time, a rich time, and we'll be, um, we're, we're using the series that our publishing house puts out, and it's called For God So Loved. And so I'm using their outlines, um, and uh, uh, it'll be a good, a good series to, to work our way through. Um, you know, there are two types of people in this world. Uh, there are those who love the wilderness, who love to go out and camp and hike, uh, fish, and then there are those who don't, right? Uh, there are those who their idea of roughing it is a mountain cabin somewhere with a big picture window looking out over the wilderness, Right? I'm not sure which camp you're in. Uh, I know that in this congregation, there are some in each camp. There are some that just say, who needs a tent? I'll go out and sleep under the stars. In fact, my son Nathan uh, has challenged me. He said, Dad, can we just go out and spend the weekend? I'm like, what? Doing what? He said, well, I said, camping? He said, well, no, not really. Um, I said, you know, building a campfire and cooking hot dogs over. He says, no, not really. Let's just go and stay out in the middle of nowhere and find grubs to eat. I don't know. That's not my idea of the wilderness, all right? That is not really my idea of the wilderness. Um, you know, uh, for some, uh, the untamed wild is an opportunity. It's an opportunity for adventure. It's an opportunity to be challenged, and it's an opportunity to explore, but for others, the wilderness is this, this beautiful sight that's to be viewed through a picture window where you don't need any bug spray and you don't have to worry about bears stealing your food and you don't have to worry about finding grubs to eat. Now, we all have different expectations of the wilderness. And when we approach our text today, we probably are going to carry our perception of the wilderness into it. We have these preconceived ideas or notions about what the wilderness is, and we're going to drag those preconceived notions into it uh, to an extent, and it's either going to be this vast, beautiful wonder, or it's going to be this challenging, desolate landscape that we should really be viewing from afar. Our scripture today is Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. And this is a period in the life of Christ that is 40 days. And it's 40 days of preparation, much like Lent is. So Luke chapter 4, starting in verse 1, working our way through 13. It says this. It says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and he showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me and I can give it to anyone I want. If you worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, it's written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Well, the devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, 
he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, it said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. So which was it? A great adventure or a challenging, difficult 40 days that Jesus had to survive? I want to throw a third option in at this point, a third possibility. Because when the Jews thought about the wilderness, it would have conjured up a very different image. The, the image wouldn't be of camping as much as it would be of journeying. It wouldn't be of picture windows in the mountain lodges so much as it would be looking out of a tent flap for years. For, for them, the idea of wilderness would bring up images of, of Moses and the Exodus story. Moses, if you recall, he was led into the wilderness after killing the Egyptian who was beating a Hebrew slave. The wilderness for Moses became a place of refuge until the day that he saw a burning bush. And suddenly the wilderness became a place of calling, a place where God spoke, and he had the choice to answer. Out of the place of calling, the wilderness became once again a place of refuge. Not just for Moses this time, but for all of the Hebrew people who fled the oppression of slavery in Egypt. In that same wilderness that God spoke, he spoke again, and he spoke through the Ten Commandments this time, calling his people to be a people of covenant relationship with him and with one another. The wilderness also became a place of provision where the children of Israel were fed manna and quail and where water flowed from rocks. This wild and untamed wilderness however, was not just a place of refuge, of calling, and provision. It was also a place of great temptation. You see, around every corner, the, the children of Israel were tempted to forsake God. They were tempted to, uh, to turn their backs on him, even though he was performing miracle after miracle after miracle for them. They put up statues to worship instead of worshiping God. They grumbled about the food that they were receiving. They, they complained about the water. And ultimately, when they were told to take the promised land, the Israelites fell into the temptation of not trusting God. And they were forced to wander through the desert, through the wilderness, not for 40 days, but for 40 years. And those 40 years, they were years of temptation and they were years of trial. But they were also years of hope and years of promise. And what we see reflected in these 40 days of Jesus' wilderness journey is similar to what the Israelites went through. It's a time when, when Jesus also finds refuge. And it's a time when his calling becomes strong. He was tempted, and in the midst of the wilderness, he found provision. And we, we can expect refuge and calling and provision, even in the middle of the wilderness experiences in our life. I titled this, series, or this, this message, The Expectations in the Wilderness, and I, and I think that there are four things that we can expect when we go through the wilderness experiences in our life. The first one is this. It's wilderness refuge. Wilderness refuge. You know, I think if we're walking with God, we really don't have a choice. The wilderness is something that we have to go through. 
We can't just come up to the edge of it and say, oh, that's not for me, and turn around and walk back. We can't walk around the wilderness. Not if we're going to be all that God's created us to be. The wilderness is something we have to go through. And if we were to look at the context of the passage that we just read together, if we look back at chapter 3, Chapter 3 tells us about this really odd character who also ate grubs named John the Baptist. He was described as a wild man who lived in the wilderness and off of the wilderness. John the Baptist talks about the one who is coming that will prepare the way. And he paints the picture of, uh, for us of this crooked wilderness path being made straight. And if that's the case, then the wilderness isn't something to be avoided. But instead, like Jesus, it's something to enter. And as Jesus entered, it makes a difference for us. The wilderness is not just a place of barrenness. It's also a place of promise. Look at this refuge. Look who led Jesus into the wilderness. It was the Holy Spirit himself. The Holy Spirit is the one who led Jesus into the wilderness. He entered the wilderness in the company of the Trinity. Jesus did not enter alone. If we jump over and we make a parallel between Jesus' journey and Moses' journey, Jesus fasted for 40 days while in the wilderness. In Deuteronomy 9, Moses fasted for 40 days and nights, and he prepared for the revelation of God on the stone tablets. See, fasting in the Old Testament was often preparation for divine revelation. And the fasting of Moses and the fasting of Jesus, they parallel each other in such a way that it's clear that it's a time of preparation for divine revelation to Jesus as well. God was with Jesus, and in the wilderness, he found refuge. We, too, can find refuge in the wilderness. We're led into wild places in our lives. We often resist those places. They're not fun to go to very often. And they can but even in the midst of them not being very fun, they can be times of great refuge and change or reformation in our lives. And this Lent, as we lean into the purpose of these 40 days, they're 40 days of refuge and reformation for us. It's a time for us to remove ourselves from the chaos of this world and prepare ourselves for divine revelation in our lives. The wilderness is a place of refuge. But it's also a place where we find calling, a wilderness calling. As Jesus entered the wilderness, his calling was being confirmed. You know, again, we have the benefit of the entire book, the entire picture. And if we look at the context of this chapter, we know that Jesus is being led into public ministry through this time in the wilderness. In fact, when he comes out of the wilderness, he uses the words of Isaiah to declare that the Spirit of the Lord is upon him. In these words, he says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus enters public ministry through the wilderness. His identity is also being affirmed in the midst of the wilderness temptations, who Jesus is, the fact that he uh, on one hand, is the promised Messiah, the very Son of God. And he's being, that's being reconfirmed in the wilderness. But on the other hand, the wilderness is also affirming that he is a humble servant devoted to worship, 
to the service of God. And so Jesus, the humble servant who is the Son of God, is being called to preach a simple but powerful message to the poor, to the prisoners, to the blind, to the oppressed. That's very similar to what we see happening to the Israelites after they left Egypt. I I maybe have shared this passage of Scripture before in a sermon, but it absolutely is one of my favorite passages. Uh, Exodus chapter 15, we read this story about the fact that God is shaping our identity and he's shaping our calling in the wilderness. Look what's happening. Moses led Israel from the Red Sea And they went into the desert of Shur. For three days they traveled in the desert without finding water. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. That's why the place is called Marah. So the people grumbled against Moses saying, what are we to drink? And then Moses cried out to the Lord and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water and the water became fit to drink. There the Lord issued a ruling and instruction for them and put them to the test. He said, if you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all of his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Then they came to Elam, where there were 12 springs and 70 palm trees, and they camped near the water. This is a story, it seems like it's a story about water, where you have this water that's so bitter that you can't drink it. And God shows Moses this piece of wood to throw into the water, and the water becomes sweet, and they're able to drink it. But it's more than that. It's really a story about the hearts of the people, because their hearts were bitter. Their hearts were bitter. They were grumbling against Moses, grumbling against God. And God's point in this miracle is to say to the people that your hearts are bitter, but that's not who I made you to be. I made you to be my holy people. And so their identity is being shaped in the wilderness from from those who were oppressed in slavery to the people, God's holy people. He's shaping their identity. Why? Because of their calling. And what was the calling of Israel? To be a blessing to all people. Hear, O Israel, the the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And if you jump over to the New Testament, Jesus throws in, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. So God is shaping their identity into the holy of people of God that he designed them to be and he's presenting them or preparing them for their calling in the wilderness. Our calling, our identity can be shaped during Lent. We can find our call in the wilderness You see, we're brought back to these images of Moses and we're being called to be the free children of of God and to see Jesus called into the desert by the Holy Spirit. We're brought back to these images because Lent is that time of calling and identity shaping in our lives. It's not just a time of calling. It's not just a time of, oh boy, I forgot the first one. What was the first one? Um, what, what is it? Refuge. It's not just a time of refuge. It's not just a time of calling, but it's also a time of temptation. That's the one that we all think of with this story. It seems to be pretty obvious here. Jesus is tempted to meet his own immediate felt needs uh, by turning stones into bread. But Jesus understands that there's more to life than just food. He's tempted to to, to succumb to celebrity and authority by becoming the ruler of the kingdoms of this world. 
But Jesus understands that God alone is the one who's owed all glory and honor when he says, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. He's tempted to succumb to power by throwing himself off the top of the temple and showing that because of who he is, God would rescue his son, surely. But Jesus understands that we should not test God, but instead should trust him. And we should trust in the power of God instead of depending upon our own power or position. Well, we too face temptation in the wilderness. I can think back through my life and any time where it has felt like a wilderness experience, there has been a temptation right there as well. Lent, it's a season of facing things that tempt us. Through, through the years, this has been done through fasting. Fasting. Fasting from things that we enjoy in order to draw closer to God. Jessica just shared with me the other day that some of her classmates, oh man, this might be a challenge for all of us. Some of her classmates are, are fasting from social media. Oh. I said, I, I don't have any problem with giving it up as long as I can keep Facebook. I don't do anything on Facebook, anything except for stalk people. Fasting, fasting to, to face the things that tempt us and to draw closer to God. <laughs> Maybe we should give up sweets. Maybe I need to give up coffee. Maybe that would be the one thing that I should give up. You, you see, as we give it up, we can learn to stand firm against things that do tempt us in the power of Christ. One of the ways that we do that is through the knowledge of Scripture, just like Jesus knew the scriptures, and that helped him to stand against the temptations. Um, each week, I, I kind of had a little epic fail this week. I forgot to get to Twyla, the uh, graphic for this series and the memory verse. But after this week, um, there will be a memory verse on the front. I would encourage you to read it. Read it, learn it, memorize it. Because there will come a day when that scripture will help you to stand up to something that's tempting you, something that's tempting to draw you away from God. Put it in your Christian toolkit so that you can pull it out and use it just like Jesus used scripture. So in the wilderness, we can expect refuge. We can expect uh, to better understand our calling. We can expect to be tempted. And finally, we can expect God to provide for us. There's provision in the wilderness. You know, God always takes care of us. We're, in the, we're in, the, in the wilderness. Easy for me to say. There are lots of times when you start into a wilderness experience, and if you wonder, where are you, God, in all of this? But just like Jesus wasn't alone, and God took care of him, we're not alone and he takes care of us. Jesus' needs were met. In the uh, Gospel of Matthew, it finishes this way. It says, Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended him. Now, if I didn't eat for 40 days, I think I would need angels to attend to me as well. But the point of it is, is that God cares for us. We're in the middle of the wilderness. It compares to the needs of the children of Israel in the wilderness. They, they didn't need to leave the wilderness to be cared for. God cared for them in the midst of it. He, he provided fresh water for them uh, when, when there was none. He provided manna for them Manna, this, this really strange substance that appeared every morning except for the Sabbath. And when it appeared, the people looked at each other and they looked at the stuff and they said, what is it? What is it? And for 40 years, they ate, what is it? 
that's what manna means. What, what is it? And for 40 years, God provided for them through this substance that they didn't have a clue what it was. For 40 years. Jesus was given strength and words in the midst of his temptations. There, there's a statement that I heard in a sermon that has stuck with me. It's very cliche, but it has stuck. You know how cliches do that once in a while? It was simply this. God won't guide where he doesn't provide. God won't guide where he doesn't provide. The Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness and the Holy Spirit continued to be present with Jesus, providing for him even in the midst of the toughest temptations. We too can find provision in the wilderness. We often think of the wilderness as a wasteland, a place where we go alone and a place where no one can go with us. But we're reminded through this text that God does not abandon us, even in the midst of the wilderness. When we're faithful to seek after him, like we might discover during this season of Lent, we might just discover that God provides for us in ways that we don't always recognize in our day-to-day life. In what ways is God providing for you in the midst of your wilderness? Over these next 40 days, I would challenge you to ask that question. How is God providing for me? The wilderness can't be avoided We might want to try to avoid it, but it can't be avoided. We'll find ourselves in the midst of the wild and untamed expanses of life at one time or another. The temptation is to avoid them or to view them as places where nothing good can happen. But the wilderness, the wilderness should be a place of growth. And it can be a place where we're restored. A place where we're challenged in our life to become the holy people of God. It can be a place where we're we're called, where we hear our calling clearly, more clearly. And it can be a time to see the provision of God in the midst of scarcity. As a people... Let's walk into this time of Lenten wilderness with the expectation that God is going to walk with us through it. Let's stand together this morning. Our our worship team is coming up. As they do so, a great time to commit to this season of Lent, to, to uh, asking God to meet you there in the middle of the wilderness. Maybe he wants to teach you something individually. I think he wants to teach our church something. It feels like we've been walking in the wilderness a while, doesn't it? Um, but he's faithful. He's with us. He provides. In the midst of it, there's refuge. And in the midst of it, we collectively, collectively can find our calling. Let's sing this song together this morning.